don't make large mistakes, so you can recoup if you need to or that kind of thing, um, but still wanting to move forward kind of thing. Um, having said that, last year we went to a camp in another state, in case this message ends up on the air, and <laughs> the problems we had there is most of the state, in fact, the problems we had there is they didn't have or use only one version of the Bible, right? And we here believe that we need to use one version of the Bible, meaning the King James Version of the Bible. So we had a problem with that, and we discussed it with the people, some of us did, discuss it with the people that were speakers there, just to let them know nicely where we were at involved in that, and kind of use that as a jumping off place from something that we would consider negative because you can't grow with no foundation. But take this idea of what they're doing with this camp and what we saw the previous year in Missouri and the positives from those things and say, you know what, we just need to do this. We need to have our own camp. If it's any way possible to have our own camp, we need to do this. You know, we have enough understanding, we have enough forward progress and enough youth, for lack of a better term, that we need to move forward with reaching out to uh, other people um, of, of the grace movement, but also other people, even making it available to them. And uh, so that was the purpose, from my viewpoint anyway, of wanting to do this, of seeing how other people, I, I've been, I was raised in camps and conferences, okay, and I've seen the benefits of them, but can I say nicely, I've also seen how, well, I wouldn't know that before. You, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? You see things, you get around and you check things out and you see how things are done and you, you get to see and learn from the positives, but you can also learn from the negatives, things that you would have done differently. Or like if you, if you spend very many years around conferences, you're thinking, wow, you know, why did that individual get put for that message? And I'm not trying to be negative, but you can learn from those things. You can learn, wow, you know, if I were to ever do this in the future, you know, I would have made sure that the people understood things about that particular topic before I gave them that topic to do. You know what I'm saying? Those are important things from, uh, I don't want to say manager, from a, from a directory type thing to, to, do, to know, okay? And through the years, I've written stuff in notebooks what not to do, okay? Because I've learned by things that I've seen, and I've also learned greatly about what things that were right, other people were doing right, other camps were doing it right. And uh, there's three, four, probably only three or four of us that went to Rocky Mountain Grace Camp, who remembers that way back in the day. Probably only three of us, the three, yeah, I was three. <laughs> but, you know, it was a neat, it was a neat camp, okay? And the guy that uh, would run the camp, more or less, or was a very grandfatherly kind of a guy, not just because he was older, he was a very meek and mild-mannered individual, okay? And because of that, there was a lot of different dynamics there. But interestingly enough, he was able to run that for years and years and years and affect people and to help the families and that kind of thing. It was a neat thing for years and years. So, you know, why are we having our camp? You know, there's some things that we've understood for quite a few years, and I want a little bit of, for lack of a better term, audience participation on this. Uh, some things that we already know, I didn't put a board up here, but things that we already know that we've got in our head wrapped around and we gather some, gather some understanding on, the basics of what we call right division, dispensationalism as a whole. We understand the unique ministry of Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. We understand that uh, you know, mid-Acts through Philemon, we understand the concepts of right division and what it means, okay, as far as dispensationalism. But then, you know, as years progress, we see some other things that we kind of add to our list, okay? Um, for instance, and you might want to write this just by way of notes and for your own reference point, write these things down, okay? Right division. Well, I, in fact, I would do it this way. This is the way, oddly enough, let me just look at it this way. Here's our, uh, our older camp brochure that we're working on. Our final authority, right, must have the foundation of God's word, right? There has to be an absolute to base things on, right? Our final authority. The next one, right division, or our gospel, understanding the unique ministry of Paul and so forth. 
But then the next, the next point is to me where in some gray circles, there's not a lot of cohesiveness. There's not a lot of bonding. There's not a lot of maybe even progression or growth in, okay? Trans dispensational principles. Seeing the Bible as a whole, understanding that God didn't change from the past into how he's relating with us today. Now, he did change in how he's relating as far as dispensational things. But what God believed was wrong in the Old Testament is still wrong today, right? I mean, the principles of godliness, okay? Maybe I should say it that way, the principles of godliness, okay? Trans-dispensational principles. Principles that are applicable all the way through the Bible, okay? So I, 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 I'm slowly getting to the point in my, in my teaching where every time I talk about right division, I want to temper it with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Let's go to that real quick by way of uh, reminding ourselves. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that's why we wrote the song, What's the Doctrine For? Right? That's what, you know, the motivation that comes out of uh, understanding the right division, understanding the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? Colossians 1, 20. Understanding those things is a neat thing to understand, but as David Reed mentioned in his message last night in Chicago, you can understand some doctrine, you can understand some knowledge, but it can affect you with pride if you're not, if you don't start applying it to how you live. And that was a neat message last night. Only, that was just a little bit of clip out of, but it was the part that I got the most out of, but because it hits home. It hits home with all grace believers, actually. So anyway, we see the principle here of all Scripture being beneficial to our understanding, okay? And interestingly enough, go to Romans 16, the verse that a lot of people use to explain more things about the mystery. The very next verse, to me, is helpful along those lines as well. We'll read 1625 by way of context. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. See, there's something about obedience that promotes the idea of responsibility, doesn't it? Yeah, it just does. And, and, and seeing those things helps us understand why Paul says over there in Romans 1, he starts the book and ends the book with the term obedience of faith. Romans chapter 1. And verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. See, that's why when we were there in the camp in this other state, we were more definitive about our lines of thinking regarding something that we believe is the faith, right? If you've got to obey something, we all need to have the same one, right? Sure, and we know that, and that was, in some senses of the term, is baby grace. I mean, if you don't understand it, you have you need a Bible, and everybody needs to have the same one. You know, you don't really know where to grow, grow from, where to, where to, where to be rooted, even, much less built up and established. Okay, so you see this idea of obedience to the faith, right? And that's on both ends of Romans, and that's a neat thing to see. So the things that we've seen and grown from being right division, we, we, we go into the principles. We, 
go into understanding what godliness looks like in our lives. Trans-dispensational principles. The fourth message being godly order in the home. Okay? Godly order in the home. Talking about the entity of uh, marriage and how God designed it to work and so forth. Then the, the fourth being, the, the fifth being basis of relating. Some people say, what's that? Well, if you don't understand the first message about the godly order of the home properly, then you're going to have a tough time evaluating what godliness looks like in another person. And you can base your relating on either the relating itself, getting to know people. What's that mean anyway? I mean, in the day that we live in, you know what I'm saying? Or you can base it on fellowship. How that person functions how he lives out or she lives out their life via the Word of God, how they relate to their younger brothers in Christ, how they relate to their younger brothers in their family, younger sisters in their family. The real things in life. Doctrine is real, and it literally comes out of you when you live it. That's what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit. So we see those things, and how we relate is important, vitally important. Then the next issue, which pertains to all that, modesty and purity. That's huge. Billy gets that, by the way. He gets the toughest message. <laughs> but he's a gutsy guy. I mean, you know. But I understand what he believes about it, and we, you know, we, we confer and we understand it. So anyway, modesty and purity is it, huge because if you don't have modesty and purity, and you don't know how to, what it looks like in somebody else, it, it, how are you going to relate to them correctly? And if the person is immodest, you might, and you're pursuing godliness, you're going to have to draw some lines in the sand, right? Sure. Or your compromise. Next, next one. Divine intervention. What is divine intervention today? What's it look like? Okay. We've, we've gotten quite a bit into that in the past here. What's not, obviously, how God is not dictating the physical circumstances of our lives from the outside. He is in the business of allowing His Holy Spirit, when we are led by the Holy Spirit, to dictate our lives from inside out. That is what glorifies God. Whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And when we think of it that way, and we understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we understand what it means to renew our minds that we may prove. God wants us to prove some things down here. You know, he's in the business of literally affecting our lives. Some people, by the way, some people have a tough time with that. Sometimes I do, honestly. I say all the time, you know, when I'm not doing the right thing, I don't want to get in the Word of God. Because it'll tell me that I'm doing the wrong thing, right? It's a mirror. It's literally designed to discern the thoughts and intents of our heart. Okay? So when you, when you, when you understand those things from the Word of God, and you read those things from Hebrews 4, you know, I like to read Proverbs by way of principles. And uh, when you read those things, you're like, wow. God's Word literally is designed to intervene in our lives. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It tells us we're to walk by faith in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So you see the principle of how faith works. Isn't that a tricky phrase? How faith works. There's a good verse for that. You would. Galatians chapter 5. A lot of people have problems with they think that faith and works are conflicting. I don't want to teach a whole message on this, but I'm on the topic. Galatians 5. Verse 5. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Say that. There's this thing called the love of Christ that's supposed to be constraining us, motivating. Interesting. That's why he 
Bible says over there in Ephesians 3. That, and you know the love of Christ, right? That we may know him, right, in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made in one of the his death. Philippians 3. There's, there's an idea there of loving God, loving his word, and growing up into him. I like to call it progressive sanctification, okay? Literally talking about responsible grace. That's not something we can do in the energy of our flesh. We'll never be able to do it in the energy of our flesh. But let me ask you a little question. Does it happen in your flesh? Well, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when we're led by the Holy Spirit, it happens in our flesh. But it's called a work of God, right? Philippians 1. Let's go look at that real quick. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 and verse 6, I believe it is. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. The living out of the Holy Spirit in your life is done when we're led by the Holy Spirit. It's really a no-brainer if you think of it, right? But when you look at the principle of fruit, fruit is is what comes off the tree. I mean, you, you take it to, to make it useful. You have to take it off the tree. You ever look at it that way? That's interesting. You ever see somebody that has a beautiful fruit tree in their backyard? tree grows. Peaches get all blossomed. And, and they just keep going out there and looking at that peach tree and saying, wow, that's, that's some really nice fruit. And a couple of months later, the fruit's rotten. It's falling off the tree and it's dying because it's not being picked, right? It's not being made into jam or whatever it is you want to do with it, okay? Sometimes we find ourselves in that, in that little paradigm. There's fruit there, but it's not being used. It's not being picked. It's not being fruitful. Okay? But the fruit that we have that's useful is literally a byproduct of the Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And that fruit of the Spirit literally comes out of us when we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit. And uh, by the way, that is what is... I'll go to Galatians 5, if you would. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. This I say then, walk in spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, last week we had, up on the board, we had these two guys, right? Old man, new man, right? Well, that verse shows you that even though your old man is dead, he is still a power in you when you allow him to be. Okay? If you didn't, if you, if you thought Romans seven wasn't conclusive enough, this verse shows you. This I say then: Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Realization of the fact that you're still in case with the fleshly body that wants what it wants, just like a little baby before it's taught a few things. Okay. Realizing that can be a very because you need to be honest in order to be able to be helped. I do, okay? But the life doesn't just come by realizing who that old man is, right? It's realizing who the new man is, right? Put on the new man. That shows you there, there's a principle, Ephesians 4, go to Ephesians 4 real quick. That principle that we read briefly last 
last week. Verse 22, Ephesians 4, 22, that she put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see a principle. This is a progressive thing. This is not done just once in your life, and you're good to go. It's a principle of a perpetuating decision-making process, which we do numerous times every day. Really do. So you need to see it for that, because one side, the old man, is death to your spiritual walk. But the new man is life, and that's Christ, right? Galatians chapter 5 shows you this. Galatians chapter, I'm sorry, Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. There's a principle here that, to me, we need, between this verse and Romans 6.11, we need to understand what death is in order to be able to fully understand what life is, okay? That verse over there in Romans 6.11 says, Reckon therefore yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, okay? But if you teach that verse, like, I don't have to worry about sin.
substances, for instance, that if I thought that, you know what, that old habit I had eight, 10, 15 years ago of pornography, that old habit that I had is no longer an issue in my life. It's a sin that God paid for. Well, that's true in principle, right? Sure, he paid for all sin. But how does that affect me on a day-to-day -day basis? I've got to live the life of Christ, right? In him, it's yay. But in me, what? It's not a day, right? So if I tell myself, which I did for a while, that I can... How's that, how's that verse go? Romans 13, 14. Make no provision for the flesh. I'm not going here. I'm not going here. I'm making no provision for it. Well, where's my flesh? It's right here. So even though I'm making no provision, I'm doing it in the energy of my flesh. See that idea? Boy, that causes failure in your life. It does mine anyway. So the way to make no provision for the flesh, the way to realize where the death is in your life is to appropriate the life. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why over here in Ephesians 3, now let's read some more of this chapter first. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. See the conundrum there? The life of Christ is supposed to be coming out of individual members of the body of Christ in our mortal flesh. And yet our mortal flesh is also to be reckoned dead, right? Interesting, right? That's why we're vessels of honor or dishonor. Second Timothy 2. Verse 12. So then death worketh in us life in you. And the better we understand that, the better we're able to get a grasp on how to protect ourselves. Okay? That list of armament over there in Ephesians 6 is there for a reason. It's vitally important to understand where you're weak. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6. Let's, let's look at that real quick. I have no idea what time it is. Ephesians chapter 6. Thank you. That's right, isn't it? Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in your flesh. No, preacher. <laughs> okay? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See that idea? We need to know where to go to get power. Right? We need to know where to go to get energized right? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, right? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, look at that verse. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. If we're wrestling against flesh and blood, we're doing wrong, okay? If I'm wrestling against my own flesh, my own problems. I'm doing it wrong. See that idea? I didn't get that for a long time. Okay? That verse I quoted part of a minute ago, Romans 13, 14, where it says, Make no provision for the flesh. Make no but wait, wait, wait. It says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. That shows you where to get the power. That shows you where to get the life, right? I, I'm slowly learning that. If you're in the thing doing it, then it's easier to avoid the problems. It just is. You get too busy doing things for the right reason, maybe, that you don't get so consumed with what your worries are about your negative things that you've done. Say that right? Flipping three, basically. Okay. Things which uh, are behind, you know, between fourth and things which are before. Forgetting those things, right? Forgetting the things which are behind. That's the negative things that we've made mistakes at, okay? 
You can't move forward. I got a t-shirt at home. It says the training domain up here, and on the back it says, you'll never become who you want to be by, re by remaining who you are. Not a bad statement as far as progression is concerned. Now, if it's talking about who you want to be, you yourself, well, who do you want to be? You better want to be who Christ wants you to be, right? So it's kind of tricky that way. you got to be careful how you use it that way. But if you want to be who Christ wants you to be, then you, you better figure out how to access that power in your life, how to access the life of Christ in your life. So anyway, those things, divine intervention. When, when I get to talking about divine intervention, I get excited because God literally designed an organism called the body of Christ so that his Holy Spirit can come in through the ministry of the Holy Word, his word, his mind, his faith, right? So that mankind who believe it, accept it for what it is, and believe something about themselves that they can't do, right? Then they start getting the ministry of the Spirit. It comes inside, it seals them, right? And then he says, you're a child of God. I personally believe that Anyone who, well, Galatians 2 says that too. Let's look at that. Galatians chapter 2. The principle in verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, right? So your heirs according to the promise. So when you see this idea of being a child, you know there's an inheritance involved, okay? And, and I mean, I'm not going to get into Ephesians 1 right now, but the idea is divine intervention today is huge in the grace movement. To understand, I was in Galatians 3, verse 26. I'm sorry, what did I say? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably wanted to read 2.16 too, but... Yeah, read 2.16 while you're there, too. Galatians 2.16. Knowing this, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. The principle of believing what God said has always been the issue in any dispensation. Okay. Now, granted, they believe different things in different dispensations. I understand that. And we who understand right division understand that, dispensationalism. But the idea has always been to accept what God says about it. And as a Christian, that doesn't change. Can I tell you, sometimes it does in my own life that sometimes I don't necessarily look for what God says about something that I'm having a problem with in my life. I realize in the dispensation of grace that you don't just bow your head and pray ignorantly asking God for answers. He says to study to show thyself approved to God. So the things of how we function in this body have to be in here for us to be able to get instructions about it, right? Sure. So study to show yourself But there's some things that about that principle to me of responsible grace that are very important to me. I mean, progressive, progressive sanctification. Your walk, your everyday living out manner of life. Paul said, you've known the doctrine that I did. That my manner of life, how he lived every day, day in and day out, right? That's important. And uh, we talk a lot about that because that's what divine intervention is about. God wants to affect Satan's domain. He's the God of this world, the same all the time, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, right? Satan is the God of this world, small g. But he set it up where all these creatures, uh, all these of creation that we call them Christians, says you're a child of God, have the opportunity to grow up into Christ, to 
up into the faith and to literally glorify God by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And we see the principle here of the mystery. Paul talking about it. Ephesians chapter 3. We'll start in verse 8. Unto me who is am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So obviously the things that were hid that he created by Jesus Christ were the things that were the mystery, right? They were hid. You go into uh, verse 10 now. To the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church, by the church, isn't that neat? The, by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. When the, whoever is the principalities and powers here, so by the way, that there's two teachings on this at least. Some people think that that's talking about the bad principalities. Some people think it's talking about the angels in the heavenly places. Okay, study that out. Take that home, be in Brienne, do whatever you need to do with that, okay? I'm just going to give you both sides for now because, honestly, I haven't studied it out. But we want to know that God's purpose here is that the principalities and powers, it says, in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That means that the church, the Christians, the believers, those, the body of Christ literally shows God's wisdom. What God planned before the foundation of the world began. The living organism of the body of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? And that's God's glory. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Notice that the confidence, the power, the boldness, the fervor, the zeal, all those things come about by the word of God. It comes about by the faith of him. Okay? And when you, when you see it that way, you realize that those are the things that empower us to be useful down here to glorify God. That's why he can say, whether for you to drink or whatsoever you do, all the glory of God. He can say over there in Romans 12 too, and be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove, literally prove out prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're uniquely designed to prove out the will of God on planet Earth. Our eternal life starts the day we become a Christian and it never stops. There's many halts in it in the sense that sometimes we choose to live in the death, right? But God didn't stop that. We did, right? Go to Romans chapter 8. We'll try to wind this up a little. Romans chapter 8. There's a verse over there in Colossians 3 that says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See that idea? We need to let it happen. It's not something that happens without our letting it. See that idea? That's why he says over there in Romans 6, Yield your members. That decision-making process that we do perpetually is why I talk so much about progressive sanctification, okay? Growing up into Christ. Conf being conformed to the image of his son is not a one-time thing, okay? If, people, if you hear people talking at a conference camp anywhere that, that try to teach that being conformed to the image of his son is a one-time thing. Write it down. Take notes. Write down the verses. OK? 
okay, that they're using. Study it out. Be a Berean. You're not sure of it yourself. Go look at it. Get a concordance out where it uses the word image. And look at it. Get a concordance out where it uses the word conform. Conform. Conformable. Transform. Look at those verses. Arrive at your own conclusions between you and God, what the Word of God tells you. Okay? I'm not here to have any dominion over somebody's faith. We're here to help them, right? Helpers of your joy, right? Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So that shows you that when we choose to walk by the old man, that's why we feel so bad. We know better than that. There's a Holy Spirit inside of us. According to Ephesians 4, 29-32, when you're living according to that old man, it grieves the Holy Spirit if you're giving out corrupt communications that doesn't minister grace to the cares, right? So you see a principle of conditionality here. It's not conditionality of God withholding blessings. It's not conditionality of God keeping something from his children. It's conditionality because God says, believe what I say, you, there it is. It's free. Take it. Go. Oh. But what do we do sometimes? We choose to live in the old man. Then we have all the negatives that come with that. Despair, frustration, striving, all those things. So, don't look at it like God sets up conditions, because he doesn't. We do, okay? We do that. We need to take the blame for that ourselves, right? So, when we talk about the term, or you hear the term used, unconditional love of Christ, realize that God is perpetually giving his truth in love. He's not in the business of withholding the love. However, it's conditioned to the truth. His love is and always will be conditioned to the truth. When you refuse the truth, what happens? The principle of John 3, even, okay? Then they believe it not, shall be damned. Who have not believed in the only begotten Son of God, right? It's conditional. And it's no different in this dispensation than it was then. Romans 3 tells us that. Romans 5 tells us that. Okay? So we see this idea of conditionality not because God is holding something from us. He's in the business of freely giving. We are in the business sometimes of keeping it from happening. Just We just need to be honest with that. You know, if I have frustration in my life, I'm not doing it right. <laughs> okay? If I have, uh, you know, just my head, can't, can't get my head on straight and do what I'm supposed to be doing, that's because Barney got in the way again, right? That's how your old flesh works. That's why it's vitally important to know him for who he is. When he shows up, knocks on your door, you open up the door and see your face in the mirror, go, ah, it's me again. The biggest enemy we have is our flesh. It's not somebody else. It's not even bad doctrine, by the way. It's your flesh. Bad doctrine is bad, but I'm not saying that. I'm not taking away from that. What I'm saying is the idea of that we don't, no, we no longer have to deal with your flesh is not a healthy thing in the dispensation of the age of grace. Now, can you deal with them by yourself? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if you don't realize that sometimes he's coming in and taking over, then you're deceived. Go to 2 Timothy 2, and I'll try to quit. It's 1230. 2 Timothy 2. Verse 20. Well, back up to verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. This is the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. By the way, that's just as good an argument for the issue of accountability thing as what my dad used to say. Let not the judge of all the earth do right. Well, here it says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. 
Sometimes we don't always know, but do we have to? Okay? The Lord knoweth them that are his, right? That's 2 Timothy 2.19. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Wow. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of also wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, what's the these there? The vessels of dishonor, okay? He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. See, he doesn't just say, you don't never have to flee from your flesh again. He's dead. He said, flee! Youthful lust. You still have the ability in your flesh to lust. I don't think that's rocket science. Okay? I do. I know that. Flee, also youthful lust, but follow after. Look what you follow after. Righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them. Here's your fellowship basis. Look at this. Look at this verse. It's a beautiful verse. I lost my place. Verse 22. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I don't think he's saying here. You know people who are grace believers. They understand that Paul's ministry started in 9, 11, 10, right? Anyway, they're mid-acts dispensationalists, okay? And they understand all the things that basic right division teaches you. That you need to fellowship with them and them only. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's literally talking about in your life pattern, what you believe that God wants from you, what you're doing with what you have, okay? <coughs> Maybe you know a Baptist, I do if you, that act, you, you believe they're actually calling on the Lord out of a pure heart. They're doing what they have. They're doing what they can to serve God in their lives on the basis of what they know. Now, I'm not saying turn around and go to the Baptist church. I'm just trying to explain to you that to me, godliness is always the issue. You might find fellowship, if this is the basis of it here, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You might find fellowship if you're too far away from a grace assembly and you can come in in fellowship with a person of that understands basic gospel meaning Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again for justification, and that they understand that, and they're, they're a child of God. They don't understand dispensationalism. They don't understand divine intervention. By the way, that divine intervention to me is the worst doctrine to get messed up on, right? I don't know how many of you guys, I was raised in a lot of that too, even though I'm a second generation grace believer, okay? Thinking that God is doing something that he's not doing, kind of leaves you in an immature mindset about what you're supposed to be doing, doesn't it? It really does. So that's, to me, that is the most crippling, bad doctrine out there for anybody in any dispensation. That's just my own viewpoint. Okay? But when you know what God is doing, and you know what you're supposed to be doing, it empowers you to do. And that's a neat thing. Okay? So we see this principle here. Fellowshipping with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strive. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose them. Don't we oppose ourselves sometimes? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. We just got through saying it. The biggest enemy you'll ever have in your life is you. It's me. My biggest enemy is me. Okay? That's why he says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. 
How many people here that raise kids know that you have to try to explain to the child that what they're doing is actually destroying what they need to be doing for themselves? That's just a constant process. Well, God is in the business of doing that too. He's your father. Isn't that neat? Principles that we can learn by how God parents, if you would, by how we're to parent. Instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, if they don't acknowledge the truth, they're not going to repent. See that? That's important. And, verse 26, that they may recover themselves. Do you ever think about it that way? When I'm counseling people, sometimes I don't think of it that way. I think, I can, I, I can, I can help them. That's not what it says. God is glorified when man allows God to dictate it, to, to, to help with the situation. Okay, It doesn't mean we aren't instrumental, but they're to literally recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And by the way, that doesn't mean that as a Christian, Satan just comes along and goes, mm -hmm, I'm with that one. Mm -hmm, I'm with that one. No. Satan's will works similar to God's will. He has a plan. And unfortunately, when we're working by our old man, we're going in accordance with Satan's plan. Satan's will. And that is how we are taken captive by him at his will. Okay? He's perfectly fine. I mean, he would rather us not be Christians at all. Okay? Because he wants to see us in hell later. Okay? But if we're Christians, at least he can do is keep us from being active or functional or helpful to other Christians. Right? Sure. And so if he can keep us opposing ourselves, and then we're taken captive by him at his will. We're not functioning like a son, a joint heir. We're not growing up and being conformed to the image of his son. So the idea of progressive revelation, or progressive uh, sanctification, or growing up into Christ is to me where we're at, hopefully, uh, after five years. We're, we're growing a little into those things. We're trying to learn more about them carefully. And yet we're realizing how vital they are in grace. The uh, belief patterns of most grace, well, a lot of grace assemblies has even changed when you go to the conferences that you see that a lot of them, of some of the speakers define grace by Titus 2.11. Grace is to teach us that denying ungodliness and world lust, we should live godly and soberly, righteously and soberly in this present evil world. With that definition of grace, it teaches us to, to have responsible grace, doesn't it? You know, you, you really don't understand how to become responsible until you realize that he's made us able. When you realize that ministry of Christ in you, the hope of glory, literally makes flesh able to allow, to let, to yield your members as instruments of righteousness. That empowers you, and it should empower you to live the life of Christ. What God does for us is amazing. I think that's part of the unsearchable riches of Christ. By the way, I'm not really crazy about that, that old song, all the unsearchable riches of Christ, because the very next phrase said, well, that can never be told. I think we're supposed to grow up into that. I'll teach you sometime. Riches, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Okay? Well, hopefully that was instrumental and helpful. But th there's a lot of things that we're, I hope, hope anyway, trying to progress through. Some of it we hash out. We literally talk about and try to figure out and try to grow into that are things that are sometimes hard to uh, understand in some, in some great circles, okay? And we don't, we don't want to get them wrong. We want to take our time and, and bow in the humility to the supreme authority of the Word of God. And, uh, but anyway, looking forward, that's really why we did the camp, in my mind. Anyway. I wanted to be able to have
have a venue where we could take some of the principles that we've learned by being grace believers and having the huge advantages that we've already gotten from Brother Jordan and GSB and things like that involving the basis of right division, involving the, uh, the uh, basics on the one version issue, the understanding of the majority text and those kinds of things, and growing up into what I would actually call the victorious life principles of Romans 6 through 8. And those things alone, and then into the divine intervention and understanding those things, okay? Because the victorious life principles play into understanding the divine intervention, okay? That's why we're doing what we can to get some of those messages taught on at this camp, okay? And we're, maybe we're a little bit, I don't want to say further along, a little progressed in those areas. I hope so. And I hope we can we can affect other people that way positively for the glory of God. Let's close. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all you've given us, and thank you for the opportunities that um, life gives us when we live in your life. And uh, we can be thankful for those things. In your name we pray, amen. Comments, questions, or any anything? Uh, responsible grace, maybe. I come from the Lord. Sure. By the church. Show him, yeah. Because that was pretty good. Ephesians yeah. 3 something. Yeah. So yeah. By the church. Known by the church. It's good.